San Francisco was without cable cars. Built on gold, the railroad, China trade, and discovery of the Comstock load, it was a Wild West town in search of two things, dignity <clears throat> and a way to the top of the hill. Legend has it that one morning in 1869, a young Scottish mining engineer, Andrew Halliday, saw a man flogging a horse, hauling an overloaded horse car. The horse bent to the strain. Suddenly, it could take no more. Back down the hill they went, injuring the man, killing the horse. There had to be a better way. And so, on August 2nd, 1873, the cable car came into being. A car riding on rails and pulled by a continuous cable moving below a slot in the street. Halliday stepped up to his primitive grip, screwed it tight against the cable, and the first run was made. Successful beyond Halliday's wildest dreams, before the day was over, more than 90 people were riding a car designed for 30. San Francisco's tradition of hanging on was established. Yet for all its history, our fascination with cable cars comes from questions like, how does the car take hold of the cable? What pulls the cable? How does it turn corners? How do cables cross each other? What do the bell signals mean? And a hundred others. So let's leave yesterday and take a ride on today's California Street Line. On the way, we'll find some answers to our questions. California Street starts in the heart of the financial district, echoing to the ghosts of the Big Four, Stanford, Huntington, Crocker, and Hopkins, and James P. Flood, discoverer of the Comstock Load, whose home is the only remaining mansion on Knob Hill. Double-ended, California cars have complete controls at each end. To go in the opposite direction, the gripmen and conductor simply switch from one end to the other at each end of the line. Now, the levers, pedals, and bells. First, the grip, essentially a 300-pound pair of pliers. It grabs hold of the cable so the car can be pulled along the street and up the hills. Used as a brake going downhill, it prevents the car from moving any faster than the cable, nine and a half miles per hour. Next, the lever, which controls the woodblock track brakes, which ride along just above the rails. Sometimes you'll catch a pungent whiff of burning wood as these brakes are applied going downhill. Since the gripman controls the track brakes on only one end of the car, going down steep hills, the conductor must operate the track brakes at the other end. Then we have the wheel brakes, controlled from these large pedals. Finally, there's the slot brake, an overbuilt yet simple emergency brake. If all else fails, the gripman pulls this lever. With vicious accuracy, it throws a wedge-shaped blade into the slot with such incredible force that in some cases, it must be cut out with a torch. To get started, first thing the gripman has to do is take hold of the cable with a grip, take rope as it's called. At the Drum Street terminus of California Street, the conductor uses a lever called a gypsy to lift the cable. As the gripman feels the cable's vibration in the grip, he moves the grip lever partway back. This grabs the cable, but loosely, so that it slips right through without moving the car. At the rear, the conductor rings the signal bell twice. The gripman pulls back farther, and the grip gently grabs hold. 
with tremendous force, possibly as much as 30,000 pounds per square inch. Next stop, Chinatown. Beneath each of these small steel plates is a carrier pulley on which the cable rides. As we pass, the grip simply lifts the cable up. Approaching Old St. Mary's Church, look down Grant Avenue into the mysteries of the Orient. Strange spices, dragons, exquisite silks. Now, at the foot of each hill are large steel plates. These cover depression beams, each a complex system of a strong bar with pulleys underneath to prevent the cable from pulling up against the slot. The beam must also move out of the way when the cable car's grip passes. As it approaches, the grip strikes the beam, pushing it out of the way. Counterbalanced, the beam pivots from a point below the grip. As the car passes, the grip holds the cable down. Finally, the beam swings back into place. A block from the top, a special traffic signal to our right, cable cars only. On the left at Powell Street, a signalman's booth. Once started up, cars must be kept moving until through this intersection, so all tracks are controlled from this tower. The light turns green. We're moving again, but be ready to get off because we're going to transfer to the Powell Mason car we just saw crossing. Years ago, it was decided that where cable lines cross, the oldest one at the crossing was the superior cable with the right to remain on top. This makes operation easy for the older California Street line. Its cars can keep hold of the rope as they cross. Powell Street cars, Powell being the newer line, must instead climb the hill, quickly let go upon cresting, maintain speed to coast through the intersection, then stop on the opposite side. Powell Street cars are single-ended. With only front controls, they must be turned around at each end of the line. Yet the conductor still has a rear wheel brake, here operated by a crank. So we have to stay clear on the back platform. With our cable car fare receipt in hand, we board our Powell Street car for a gentle downhill run to Jackson Street, end of the Powell Street line. The gripman doesn't even have to take rope as we simply coast down the four blocks along the way crossing Clay Street where Halliday ran his first car, coming to a stop as the line divides between Mason and Hyde Streets. Passing the turnout or switch that divides the two lines, we coast into a depression built into the street. Called a take rope dip, this lowers the grip to the level of the cable so the gripman can grab hold by simply moving the grip around until he feels the cable. If he has trouble finding the cable, he then uses the simplest method of all. With a strong hook, he reaches under and lifts until the cable is in the grip. We are now going to turn onto Jackson Street. There are two ways a cable car turns corners. The simplest is a drift or let go curve. A car going downhill simply drops the rope, coasts around, then picks it up on the other side. The turn from Powell on to Jackson, however, is uphill, so a more complex system, a pull curve, is used. Made up of a series of pulleys to carry the cable around, in this type of curve, the grip keeps hold of the cable all the way around. To prevent the grip and pulleys from hitting each other and being destroyed in the process, a chafing bar is employed. Positioned at grip level and just above and to the outside of the pulleys, it guides the grip around the turn. Once started through a pull curve, it's tough to stop. So when the conductor yells, Hang on for curve left. He means it. One block and we get off at the cable car barn, first built in 1887, which also houses the cable car museum. Here's the giant winding machinery that pulls the cables. Four continuous steel ropes, Hyde, California, Mason, and Powell. Each powered by its own electric DC motor turning a huge winder wheel. To keep the cable from slipping, each passes three quarters of the way round its winder wheel, under an over and unpowered idler wheel, then back to what's called a tension carriage. Tension on the rope is maintained at this wheel by a pair of chains pulled constantly back by a heavy adjustable weight. 
The carriage also absorbs any shocks which might occur when several heavily loaded cars pull onto the rope all at once. On its way to the street, each cable passes through the first of a series of strand alarms. A major risk of cable operation is a broken cable strand. Unchecked, a loose strand can catch in a grip, making it difficult or impossible for the car to let go of the cable. Over 60 of these simple-looking devices are placed strategically throughout the system. Along with 30 other safety switches, they are monitored by a form of industrial computer in the central control room. At the slightest problem, the troubled rope stops. The display tells where and what the problem is. The cable is inspected and problem corrected. Only then is the alarm manually reset and the cable restarted. Before we leave the powerhouse, let's look in on the sheave gallery under the main entrance. Here, cables return to the street through tunnels as long as three blocks. Back on the street, the best part of our ride is yet to come. The steepest grade on the entire system. Russian Hill on the Hyde Street line. The car coming is a Powell and Hyde car. You can tell by the signs on the front. As it approaches, the markings on the street tell the gripman to let go before crossing Mason Street. If he fails, his grip will hit a rigid bumper bar under the street to prevent him from destroying the superior mason rope. Again, our ferry seat gets us aboard. As we pass the car entrance to the barn, look in and you'll see a turntable for turning cars onto their storage and maintenance tracks. There are four turntables on the system, three on the street, one in the barn. So don't get tripped up if someone asks you how many there are. Now approaching Hyde Street, a yellow bar on the pavement warns the gripman to let go. The curve ahead is a drift curve. Next, a yellow bar with double X's. It means a mandatory stop. All's clear, so let's coast on to Hyde Street. Moving through a residential area, we've reached the top of Russian Hill. A brief stop. Two bells. The gripman pulls on the grip. Down we go. The conductor's brake set. Back on the track brake. The wheel brake. Hotter on the grip. Then ease off. A pause at Lombard Street, crookedest street in the world. Then down again to Fisherman's Wharf on the most efficient urban transport system in the world. You can ride them for a nickel if the age is 65. And you can ride for nothing at all if you're under five. around 